Hello and welcome to Lean in the Lab Load Leveling. My name is Sarah and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Um, before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a questions box. Please feel free to type in any questions you have throughout the webinar. We will be answering all questions at the end. This course is approved for one NBC regulatory credit, and within 24 hours you'll receive an email with information on how to obtain your credit. Finally, we are recording the webinar and we'll have it available to view on our website in about five to seven days. Now I'd like to introduce Bob Long. Bob is our Lab Trades Relation Manager and has trained in process improvement programs. He has worked closely with the founders of the Lean Institute to develop the use of lean principles to provide common sense, low-cost improvements that add value and eliminate waste in the initial lab. Bob? Good morning. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. And good morning to everybody out there. Uh, I'm so glad that you joined us today. And I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the uh, herding cats or organizing chaos or whatever you want to refer to it. We're trying to create some consistent workflow theory for the dental lab. We know for a fact that dental labs are going to be more productive and the finished work is going to be much more consistent when there is a workflow that is kept at a consistent level and it meets what our every daily market demand uh, dictates on this. It's kind of like, you know, flow as far as the lab is concerned is really kind of like freeway traffic. Uh, if everybody is driving at 65 or 70 miles an hour then and everyone is consistent and everyone is moving along at the same clip then everything flows smoothly and there's not really a problem but it's when the little old lady there that's driving at 35 miles an hour or the uh, the race car driver that's going 110 starts to disrupt the flow then things begin to happen Likewise, if it's Friday before a three-day weekend, then obviously traffic gets a lot heavier and there can be problems with that. And that's really what the, uh, the lab workflow is, is very, very similar to that. Then. There are many things, obviously, that's going to affect that workflow, both directly and indirectly. Uh, some of them which we have control over, some of them we don't, some of them which we have to then try to do workarounds and figure out a way that we can uh, factor these things in. Doctor scheduling obviously is a major factor. If a doctor calls and says, well, hey, Bob Long's not coming in on Tuesday and I'm going to move Mary Jones in place of that and I need to get her case on Tuesday instead of on Thursday, then obviously that's creating a, uh, a problem as far as our workflow and what we're doing. Um, the total mixture of, of restorations that we're faced with, everything from you know front of the mouth, back of the mouth, uh, singles, you know, full spans, three unit bridges, uh, implants, all the other things that factor into that then create scheduling and workflow problems for us, and we have to take that into consideration. Another huge factor in this is the, is the lack of technicians cross, cross skills, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go along. But an ability then to move a technician into place to do a certain task or function and stuff without having to uh, uh, disrupt all the other flow is extremely important. Employee pay policies have a factor into it. And if, uh, if certain people are paid certain rates for certain jobs, then it may be difficult then to, uh, to move them from one spot to another. And they may feel as though that the, their skills are best used that way and they don't want to uh, uh, do any cross-training or cross-work on it. Obviously, communication problems. 
I've been in lab. I was in a lab last week, as a matter of fact, and I was, had about a two-hour time with frame with the owner. And during that time, there were nine different times that someone came in with two or three case pans and asked specific questions about what had to be done. Now that's interruptions. That's interruptions in the flow. It's interruptions in narrow work. It's everything involved. And if if there's some way to solve that kind of communication and that uh, informational flow, then we need to look at it and see what we can do because that's going to increase our flow and our work uh, uh, patterns and within the lab. Obviously, we know that lab design. Uh, plays a huge role in this. If we're all over the place, if from one side to the other, if there, as the pan, case pan progresses throughout the lab, then obviously it's going to create more difficulty. That creates difficulty in the communication, that creates uh, passing along uh, the informational flow, it, it creates problems as far as just transporting the case pans themselves, so a lab design factor is extremely important in, in developing a, a consistent workflow. Traditional attitudes. Uh, as we talk with labs, well, we've always done it this way. It always has kind of worked out. We've always planned accordingly and so on. And they don't take the time that it really takes to go through and determine what their capacities are what their capabilities are and where they want to go. The large amounts of work and process is also a huge factor. Uh, it creates it creates bottlenecks. It creates uh, confusion. It creates chaos. At the, at the, the more stuff that we have sitting there, standing around, then uh, becomes a consistent problem. We're always then starting to maybe cherry pick on work. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, sorting a great deal, which is certainly one of the ways that, uh, that we want to get rid of as far as lean is processing, lean processing is concerned. So the work in process, if the, minimum, the more that we can minimize that, the better off we're going to be. And obviously the lack of a good, flexible, fast track process. You know, problems are going to occur. We know that. I mean, there, there's no way around it. If uh, uh, when we're working with such a high mix, low volume kind of a job shop thing, that the, these problems will occur, and we have to be able to figure out some way then that we can slide a a uh, product back into the routine and back into the flow of this in a in a uh, flexible manner, but also in a very very controlled. Still, you know, I'm of the opinion that one of the major factors, obviously, that really affects the uh, the work, lab workflow is the fact that we have some extreme volatile volume uh, problem. You know, we can look at a typical lab and say, okay, they're going to get 80 um, lab. 80 cases on one day and 120 and next and 140 or 100 or 60. And I've seen labs that did large amounts in on Monday, and that's where their biggest bulk is. And maybe that 140 would be on that day rather than on Wednesday. But the point is that there's never a consistent answer on that. Um, the total for this week would be 500 cases. And that's an average of 100. Day, then. And then you've got a further mix on that when I said the types of restoration and the fact that you've got uh, uh, singles, you've got uh, three unit bridges, you've got full spans, you've got everything else. So the units factors are going to be considerably different. The second thing that I think is going to really strongly affect the workflow on that is, is some realistic capacity level uh, on what we've got coming. If we have 500 cases coming in that week, an average of 100 cases per day, you know, we're going to have to look to try to set some limits 
and some uh, uh, paces on this to get out 100 cases per day. We can't gear to that uh, 160 because then we would have people sitting around all the time not doing anything. We can't gear down to the 40 cases per day because then we would really start to build up a backlog and have a real serious problem. So we have to look at it and try to set realistic capacity levels on it. I don't know how many of you recognize this. This is a metronome. Uh, going back to my grade school days when we were practicing in uh, music classes and things of this nature, this was a device that set up a beat then. It made a click sound so that you uh, could establish a beat that you had to work to. And it's kind of like when I was in the Army. In the Army, of course, then if you're marching, you've got a cadence to set, again, set up a pace, to set up a beat. Oh, two, three, four, so on and so forth. That uh, brings back bad memories to me. But uh, still, it's, it's the case that uh, uh, there was an order to it then, that you would left, right, left, right, and uh, it was in a certain beat, and it was that way. And the lab has to find a, a, some way to set a beat. They have to find something that's going to be the pace setter for the flow through there then. And by doing so, now then you've got a controlling standard that you can work from. You know, in, in pure lean lane, though, it's always called a tap time. But basically it is just that. It's a pace or a drum beat that we're going to work for. I want to say thanks again to Mark Jackson, who provided this uh, particular uh, chart for me. And it basically illustrates on a PFN then what the total uh, time would be to prepare a tech time to prepare a PFN. That doesn't include, obviously, your firing times, and it doesn't include the set times and so on. This is the actual technician touch time on this, which is 56 minutes. There should be charts for every single process that you have in the same way, whether it's an all ceramic, whether it is a milled process, whether it's a printed process, whatever you're doing, there should be a production that gives an exact. If you don't have this, there's no way then that you can, in fact, uh, uh, measure or uh, standardize or stuff. But if we look at this, then we can readily see that there, in our ceramic department, our build and our contour and our stain and glaze then uh, constitutes about 26 minutes of time then for that particular process. Obviously, that's going to become the standard or the drum beat or the pace setting portion of this. And that's about one unit every half hour, uh, or about 16 units a day uh, that the ceramics would be putting out. And that basically is going to, obviously, as we know, based upon the uh, uh, ceramics themselves. But that gives us a starting point. That said, hey, if we look at the rest of these tasks on there, nothing else compares to this. Nothing is is, is, uh, is is long or is complex or takes the time. That becomes a really constraint on this whole thing. And really what we're looking for is setting the pace go. And that every one of those, every 20, 26 minutes, I'm not sure that's sustainable. I mean, means that time they have very little time for any other kind of an interruption or break or anything else. So I'm not sure in my mind anyway, and I think that this is true, that you can set this as to what your the absolute standard kind of thing. But again, I think you have to measure it out based upon your own capabilities, your people's capabilities, and what you have. Personally, I like to take that chart and then look at it and say, okay, they're going to get uh, about 12 minutes to do one particular function there and on the build portion of that. 
So if that's the case, on a build basis, they're going to get about 40 units a day at, at full capacity. You have to measure it based upon some kind of a, uh, uh, problems of interruptions and so on. Nothing else stopping and talking about last night's ball game or whatever it happens to be, they're not going to achieve it. I like to look at 85% of what that capacity is and try to set that as a realistic capability. Then. In that case, then, instead of the 40, they would be getting out 34 in a day's time. Again, by doing so, you're now setting some standards, you're now setting some measurement tools that you can use on a regular basis to see where you're at as far as your production. And then as capacities change or uh, volumes change, then you, you can start to manage productively with a, with a particular number. The next thing in line, of course, I think as far as um, uh, uh, really uh, on controllable items as far as workflow becomes what I call the uh, constraint recognition. You know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And I think that this really affects then how the lab flow uh, can, can be analyzed. There's a guy named Goldrick that uh, wrote a book called The Goal. And I, if any of you have ever read it, I'm sure you, you're familiar with it. But if, if you haven't, I would strongly suggest that you take a look at it. Again, it's G-O-L-D-R-A-T-T-T. Uh, and the book is called The Goal. And it really talks about what is called the theory of constraints then and what that, what that means and how then we can recognize what a constraint would be in within our flow within the lab process. You know, the theory of constraints, it comes from the contention that any manageable system is limited in achieving more of its goals by a very small number of constraints. In this illustration, obviously, we show then where a very thin pipeline is going to be a huge constraint for the flow. But the theory of constraints then shows to identify that constraint and then restrict the organization around it yeah, so that we can uh, kind of uh, substantiate our flow based upon that one point then. It uses the five fo focusing points that we'll talk about and as far as how that it goes about doing it. But if you've got a constraint, and it, you can only flow so many through there at a time, you've also got the problem that the buildup then may cause a permanent uh, kind of a problem then and has to be shaken up, moved, and uh, resolved before we can go any further with it. So what are we going to do as far as these steps, these five focusing areas of taking a look at uh, how we increase the throughput? And incidentally, again, I want to mention that in Goldberg's Goldberg book, he talks about throughput as being basically the sale. He breaks it down and he says there's, there's operational expense, there's inventory, and there's throughput. Uh, the operational expense basically is the money that you put into the process. The inventory is the money that's sitting in that process. And the throughput then is which is your sales then becomes the money paid to the process where our real sales in take, take place. Our first step on this is to identify that constraint. What's the resource? What's the policy? What's the task that prevents the organization from increasing its throughput? Well, in a general lab, we know we can start with uh, what's the longest process then. Where are other breakdowns? What happens within the, the process that we've got that is going to serve as a constraint? There's usually one major constraint, and then there might be a series of small constraints. Then. We have to decide how we're going to exploit that constraint. How are we going to get the most capacity out of that? If, if 16 units a day is the uh, what we want out of our uh, uh, 
ceramic then, uh, and we're only getting 12, how do we get an additional amount? Uh, how can we keep everybody on the same level of this uh, as we're doing it then? And how do we then subordinate all the other processes, all the way from modeling dye, through waxing, through metalwork, through opaquing, and everything else, and align all of that with that portion of the operation then where we think with this, this constraint is then. So we can support that based upon the other thing. Then we have to figure out how we're going to elevate that. How do we make the major changes that needs to break up that constraint and what we have to do? And as a result, if we then wind up moving that constraint to somewhere else, then we've got to go back to step one and start it all over again. It is a constant process of looking at it so to improve, identify the constraint, make it, make it uh, better, and support everything else to it, and then go back and relook it. There was a, uh, uh, a great cartoon that appeared in the uh, Ventura County Star here a few years ago. And it showed then uh, what I thought was, you know, really illustrative of the the problem is that sometimes we can create. They took a, uh, uh, an old bridge, uh, redid that to the tune of $85 million, and all they did was create a new bottleneck as a result. Well, obviously, you know, we want to analyze this, and we don't necessarily want to uh, uh, make our problem worse by doing so. As I said, we're going to be more productive, more consistent, and when we keep that at a consistent level and we meet our average daily demand on that. The, uh, the theories of, uh, of, of, that go along with the uh, uh, theory of constraints and stuff on this there's one called the, uh, the drum buffer rope portion of this. And I think that this is a great way to look at this and see what we can do as far as creating some solutions to it. I thank Stuart Steinbach for creating this. I, had, I struggled with trying to come up with a good illustration. But basically what he's got here is he's got a poor little guy then that's uh, out walking the dog and the dog just takes off running whichever which way. He is a constraint on that then. And what they have done then is that we've put a, uh, uh, a person in place who is controlling the rope, who has the ability to manage the flow as such. He becomes the buffer on this whole thing. So that now then the, uh, the constraint can operate at the level that supposed to operate at are the speed and capability, and that uh, demand is set based upon uh, what is realistic then as far as the pull on it goes. So uh, uh, I think that was a great illustration that, that, that we have to work from. In this particular case, we're looking at it and we're saying then that the ceramic department, as we looked at it, was the drum. That was where the pace setting was. Yeah. And that's what, what the control is going to be. The rope, then, is the, is the work release mechanism that we would use within the lab, then, to set up our pace. And finally, then, is the, the, the buffer becomes the drum protector, or it, 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 it sets up, then, so that that ceramic department is operating at its peak efficiency and everything else is subordinate to it, then. What we're looking at is we're saying that the finished work coming out of the porcelain department is more consistent when the production levels are consistent then. And we know that the biggest reason that dentists change dental labs is an inconsistency. So the most important thing that we can do is to figure out a way that we can maintain that there is absolute consistency coming out of that dental lab. That, that 
dentist can get what he expects every time, the same way, in the same manner. So we're only going to release the work actually into the waxing department from the model and die department when there's actually work being pulled by the contour and bill or the ceramic department. That takes the longest. That becomes our pace setter. That's what we're going to look at and analyze and do. And we cannot move faster than what the slower, slowest process is within the, uh, within the low organization. This is an illustration of how we're talking about. The, the uh, buffer is set up just at the point of the build and contour of the ceramic department. That becomes the number one. When something moves out of that department, that then sets up the drum beat, sets up the signals then that goes back to the model room to say, now then you can move product from that to the next department, which is the waxing. And that and in turn then is going to move it down the line and put something back into the buffer eventually on this thing. But it's all controlled out of there. It is not uh, uh, it's kind of, again, looking at this as your drum beat, looking at this as your pace setter, looking at this to, to determine how fast things are going to go on it then. Now, we put in there the fact that there's a two-day shipping uh, buffer, and I think that's, uh, you know, I think that that has to uh, uh, be taken into consideration on that, so because there are going to be some problems that you're going to encounter. There's a lot of, of systems out there right now, uh, you know, the lab tracks, the Gen Mars, the, uh, all the systems that are there, then have the task definition in them. But basically the task definition and the timing of those that they put into the system to control this so that you do your scheduling from this are inputs from yourself. And most generally speaking, that they will then uh, uh, work on a five or six or seven day uh, schedule. And after that period, then they'll schedule a couple of extra buffer days in there, and they'll tell the dentist it's going to take 10 days to get that, although it doesn't really take that long to obviously finish up the product. But anyway, the, uh, uh, the buffer zone then it becomes very, very critical on this because that's control. That's the one place that we can have some build up and stuff. We'll have some reservoirs at certain places to draw from, such as at the end of the model work and uh, before the waxing department takes hold of it. But that release, again, is only done as a result of the signal that comes from that uh, ceramic department. There's, uh, again, in the book, uh, if, you, if you read that and you, and you look at some of the, the tenets on this thing, they use even a, a, a visual uh, alarm system or a, a knowledge system on this. They use the red, green, and blue, a red, green, and yellow uh, lights or our colors or so to indicate that if it's green, everything is okay. If it's yellow, it needs some uh, caution areas there. And if it reds, then some action has to be required. But those signals and those visual signals, which is so important as far as the lean process is concerned, then is what the, uh, the model room is looking at to see when it's time to release that product and when waxing should be pulling that product from the model department itself. Again, cases are not released uh, beyond the model department unless it's pulled downstream by the porcelain department. So the porcelain department is key. Again, there's a reserve there between the two that they can draw from at that time, but that comes in. Uh, just a reserve, and it is not a true buffer unit behind everything. And then there is a, uh, the, the porcelain department is the pace setter for the entire operation. So. 
here's kind of an illustration of looking at uh, what we looked at previously. And we said that the, the cases collected was 80, 120, 140, 160 on a five-day basis. If, if in fact, that when we said that our capacity is, is about a, our average is about market average is about 100 cases a day. We need to figure out how we're going to get 100 cases a day out of there. Now, if that's going to be our average as far as our, as our work. In this particular case, we're looking on a, a four-day turnaround uh, out the door on the fourth day, on the fifth day, actually looking at. If we're going to have 100 a day, then that's going to be 100% capacity. And based on that, we're going to have to be looking at the, at having a minimum of about seven, so around 14, 15 cases to hit that. But if we're going to build a buffer zone into that, where we're going to say we're only going to do about 85 to 80% of that, then we're going to probably have to have eight ceramics. Uh, setting it up and, and getting it done because we are going to have to try to have somewhere in the area of eight at that case would give us uh, 120 to 125 cases and then we, uh, if they were operating at 80 percent, we would be down to our 100 that we'd want to be at. So that would be a, uh, uh, an example of what we would be looking at. At this case, if we are dealing with strictly at 100 cases a day at full capacity on this thing, we have no room whatsoever for any kind of catch-up as far as rework or some major uh, catastrophe that takes place that uh, is going to cut into it and, and without going into a great deal of overtime uh, or cost-cutting or corner-cutting somewhere along the line. We don't want to do that, obviously. As I said, basically we're looking at the fact that uh, uh, 80 to 85 percent of the capacity of the build and contour process is where we're trying to figure out then exactly what our pace setter becomes on that. And then we're going to subordinate all the rest of that process to that particular level. We're going to do it by lowering some of the, uh, uh, if we can do it by lowering internal remakes to that porcelain department, we're going to help that process. Certainly if by cross-training, and this was one of the things that I said earlier on, if we can cross-train people that can perform a lot of the functions that within that build and contour process, then then we can uh, alleviate some of that constraint that, that it is built there. We to make sure that buffer is ready for them so that that work is there for them, for that constraint to perform on a regular basis and, and look at that bit. One of them, uh, again, coming back to this and looking at this, this again is a, uh, uh, I think a great illustration of just what that buffer has to be and how that you can control them that, uh, that whole process. One of the real things that I think is important is, is looking at it from the standpoint of um, uh, small batch processing. And you know, true lean processing always works on a single piece flow. And obviously, we know we cannot do that with uh, uh, the dental lab. We have to try to get it down to a reasonable number of uh, our units or where we want to measure it in and, and operate in that direction. We have found that really about five uh, units or five cases in a batch is, is the way to look at it. And if you look at this illustration, you can see that going through the model room with five takes it into waxing, takes it into investing. Oops, excuse me. Takes it into investing, takes it into the metal finishing, opaquing, stacking, and staining, and uh, finishing the workout. The beauty of this is that 
if in fact that we discover there's some problem, we're not waiting to way down the road. If we work in the batches of, of, of 20, by the time we get it through the waxing stage there, we are way down the road. And if we have to try to move all of that back into our process and into our flow, we've got a very, very serious problem on doing so. This way, you're controlling it in small batches, it is uniform, it's, and it is uh, manageable, it's, it's easy to handle, it's easy to work around and makes it more, much more flexible, and in the long run, it cuts out the, the chaos and the confusion and the, uh, uh, the problems that we could have otherwise. So, so the small batches, I strongly, strongly urge you to look at and see how that you can, in fact, uh, uh, do so. It's going to dramatically cut out uh, some of that uh, time that the, the case is, is there, sitting on shelves, uh, then it's going to improve the flow all the way around. Your internal rework is going to go down because you're going to find that if there is some kind of a systematic error, uh, systemic error that uh, occurs and in the process, you're going to know it quicker, and you're not going to have near as many infected cases then. And then you're going to be able to move into then the, uh, the, the work that uh, becomes a, uh, a problem there, that you can get it back into the schedule and into your processing uh, flow much, much easier. Also in this, I want to mention, too, the fact that you can look at uh, uh, ProPay, or uh, uh, pay for basically uh, uh, the work done on the thing. And it can play a role, in, first of all, in, in eliminating the, a lot of the QC that takes place, uh, and, and so much of the QC that it should be eliminated anyway. But if it, if it technician is responsible for making sure that this, the work that he does is right and right on target, he's not going to be passing along inferior work or problematic work or something else to uh, someone else in the system. So you can eliminate a lot of that need for this quality control that we do on it. The other thing that with ProPay is it encourages that movement around of team members. And going back to our original chart, you know, the ceramic department with where the, uh, the constraint is. But if you've got people that can move into that and they can do opaquing or they can uh, move from the model room to, uh, to a waxing position or they can uh, move into the metal work or do the other things then and you can, uh, and they're cross-trained. And then they're eligible to receive the same kind of a, a rate there, that there's no uh, chance of them getting hurt from a pay rate on the thing, they can, in fact, do that, enjoy that, and, and be a, you become a really a, an important part of the team. So I think that that's, that is, uh, it's not necessarily a part of the theory of constraints, and it's not necessarily a flow, but it is a, certainly a corollary to it, and it plays a huge role in, in establishing that as, as part of it then. To try to recap this a little bit then, number one, as a lab, you have to determine your task times for each and all of your operations, every single one of them. You have to know what they are. That becomes your measurement tool. That becomes your uh, uh, scheduling tool. That does everything. It tells you what manpower you need, when you need it, where you need it, and so on. It is absolutely essential. And it's going to vary. Labs are going to vary in that. You just can't come up with a cookie cutter operation. You know, and I again, I appreciate what Mark Jackson did for us as far as creating that as far as the PFM which still constitutes some of the, you know, the large portion of the percentage of the stuff that we're doing, but it has to be done for all of us, then. and it has to be a part of your, your standardization and your documentation. 
as you're looking at that then and you're looking at the task times it is on it, you look for any kind of wasted time. You look for any kind of idle time, interruptions that you have. So that you now then can come to that figure that's a realistic task time. Whether it's 80%, 85%, something that says, okay, here's what we've got. We've got five ceramists, a 16 units a day, average each, you know. That then becomes 90 units a day that we can put out. But there's going to be interruptions. We know it's not always going to be there. there there's going to be times that you know, we're having meetings, we're doing training. Uh, we've got other problems associated with it. So look at 90 times 80% of that. So let's say that we can do 72 units. And that becomes your pace setter, that becomes your, your drum, that becomes the, uh, 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 the drum that you have as far as your whole operation is concerned. And then you examine the entire operation for how that you make sure that you're getting it right that you're, that you're looking at. You determine then how that you subordinate all those constraints to that and make sure that they are working properly. Quick review, a, uh, a quick study on this then. Um, not a simple operation to do, but absolutely essential as far as good quality management and flow. You're going to get much, much better product out of your lab if you, in fact, then uh, have a center that So with that, well, thank you very much for your time, and I will see if there has been any questions. And I, Sarah, have we got anything that we need to discuss? Uh, well, right now we don't have any questions, and you know I would like to apologize. We've had some technical difficulty. There has been some static going uh, in and out, so we are sorry if you had missed anything. Um, so we would like to open it up for questions, though. So if you have anything, please feel free to type it in the box. Um, we do have a question, Bob. Do you have any numbers for Emacs? I do not. We're working on some numbers right now, and I've asked uh, several labs to give me some uh, uh, input on that because obviously that is a uh, uh, such an important part of the lab business today. Uh, but we, as soon as we do have, if you, if those who want uh, send me an email, we'll, we'll generate that, and I'll give you a, a chart that we can look at on that. Uh, and we're trying to do the same identical thing. And again, that would be of, uh, of, of, of maybe one or two labs, and it would not necessarily hold true for everybody. And, and obviously, we would look at, in our particular case, we're looking at uh, the maximum pressing stand. We're not necessarily thinking about the uh, mill DMAX, so, uh, uh, but we certainly will provide that. All right, and that looks like it was our only question, so if there are no more questions, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up a little early today. I, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I, just as a reminder, we will post this on our website in about five to seven days. Additionally, within 24 hours, you'll receive your information on how to obtain your credit. And I wish everybody has a wonderful day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.